Okay, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, my name is Joel Dice, I'm an engineer at Fermion. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you about one of the projects I'm working on at Fermion. Uh, the funny thing about this is it wasn't really intended to be a project. It was just going to be an afternoon exper or experiment and uh, a little time to find out if I was able to build a cloud-native app using WebAssembly and Java. And the answer to that was no. And a more practical person would have stopped there and gone on to... Uh, more productive matters, uh, but I actually decided to dig deeper, find out what was missing, and uh, so that's what I'm here to sh share with you today. And not only did I find out what was missing, I started to piece things together and added some new tools to the mix to actually make it work. Uh, and now I've become somewhat addicted, and now you have to listen to me rave about it uh, today. So. To set a little context here, this is the vision, uh, probably very fresh in your mind after Luke's talk here, that we have, which is you should be able to take any language you want, uh, in fact, a, a bundle of languages if you're a polyglot uh, development shop, and target WebAssembly, uh, build a WebAssembly component, and then run it in whatever, uh, you know, whatever target environment you, you want it to run it in. Uh, and that could include uh, application plugins, it include uh, serverless functions, it could include uh, stored procedures and databases, and of course the web browser. Uh, and a couple of things to notice about all these places I've listed here is that uh, we want to be able to provide isolation. In pretty much all these cases, we have sort of a mixed trust model where you've got code possibly from multiple origins, certainly that's uh, going to happen in a web browser, uh, but uh, potentially in any of these cases, and you want to separate them uh, from a security standpoint and a privacy standpoint. Uh, there could be sensitive data you're handling. There could be a multi-tenant situation that you need to support. Um, so that's really important. Uh, and the other thing is, in many of these cases, we want fast startup time. You know, in the browser, you want a page to load very quickly and start being interactive very quickly. Uh, you want fast startup time in terms of HTTP request handlers uh, in a serverless scenario. Uh, in a database, you want to be able to run a function on a piece of data uh, hundreds and thousands of times, and you want the latency to be minimized uh, for each of those runs. So that's going to be a big theme here is isolation, sandboxing, whatever you want to call it, uh, to ensure um, you know, that separation of concerns, separation of data, uh, separation of resources. Uh, but today we're going to focus in particular on JVM languages, Java itself, Scala, Clojure, Kotlin, whatever your favorite JVM language is. Uh, we want to see that work in all those environments. Uh, so we'll start out by looking at some of the traditional tools you would use in uh, Java development, um, and then compare those with what you'd use uh, today to develop WebAssembly components, and then see how we can combine those. And then we'll look at why you would want to do that, and also why you might not want to do it. Um, we'll look at uh, you know, performance, uh, you know, what, what sacrifices, if any, do we have to make to achieve that level of isolation um, are there, is there a throughput versus latency trade-off, uh, what have you. Um, and then we'll look at some of the limitations of the current state uh, of these, this tooling uh, and how we can remedy them over time. And then I've recorded a quick demo. The lav demo says if I tried to do it live, it won't work. So let's, let's, let's pre-record, which I had to do like six takes. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I want I want that work to pay off here, and I'm going to show you <laughs> show you the result. All right. So uh, in Java land, uh, uh, it's all centered around so-called Java bytecode, uh, and. We basically want to start as an application developer, whether I want to write my program in Clojure or Scala or Kotlin or Java itself. Uh, all of these are going to uh, compile to Java bytecode. And that Java bytecode can then be run on what's called a JRE or a Java runtime environment. And that environment has two pieces. It's got a virtual machine that interprets the bytecode, executes it. And then it's got a class library, a standard class library, which provides the APIs and, uh, and, and basic tools that you would use to build an application. And uh, that the main function of that 
those APIs is to provide access to the outside world, operating system functionality, networking, that sort of thing. So how does that compare with the WebAssembly component model uh, development experience? Well, it turns out it looks very similar. Uh, it shouldn't probably surprise you if you've been around uh, you know, computing for a few decades now, uh, you'll recognize that Java has already sort of covered a lot of this ground uh, with mixed success. Uh, certainly there were Java applets back in the day running in the browser. Uh, you could run it, you know, the whole idea was write once, run everywhere. Uh, that's what we're trying to do with WebAssembly. We're trying to do it better, uh, but uh, it's not surprising that we're following a similar pattern. Uh, and so here, you take your favorite programming language again, you compile to a WebAssembly module or component, and then you run that this time in an environment that very much resembles the J JVM, uh, but this is a WebAssembly runtime, interprets, just-in-time compiles, what have you, the bytecode uh, in the WebAssembly uh, file. And then uh, we have various APIs to interface with the outside world. That's what Luke's talk was about, is modularizing those APIs. But right now we have WASI uh, for interacting with uh, POSIX-style systems or something that can be made to look like a POSIX-style system. We have uh, web APIs, if you're running this in the browser, uh, that you can create Java shim, JavaScript shims for. Uh, and then you can you know, run that anywhere. So what would it look like to combine those things? Uh, you know, what if your favorite programming language is in fact Java or Kotlin or what have you? Uh, we we wanna be able to do the same thing. Uh, and so in order to do that, we've introduced a couple of tools here uh, that might not be familiar to you. Uh, the first one is TVM uh, and I've created, since created a friendly fork called TVM WASI and this is a tool that takes Java bytecode and will essentially transpile it to WebAssembly. And then that WebAssembly can be run as usual on a WebAssembly runtime according to the world, uh, to use uh, Luke's terminology, uh, that has been defined for your application. Uh, and so any uh, compatible host that can host that world uh, will be able to run it and uh, you know, you'll run it as usual. The, and I mentioned worlds uh, to mention the other tool, which I think uh, Luke also mentioned, which is WhipBindGen. And this takes a set of WebAssembly interfaces and generates bindings. And that's the second big contribution we've made here, which is uh, Java bindings. They landed uh, probably about a week or two ago in the WhipBindGen repository. So now you can generate Java bindings. And if you know anything about the Java ecosystem, it's very easy to reuse those bindings in Clojure or, and from Scala and so on. Uh, so one set of bindings uh, makes it usable uh, from all of those languages. So, uh, you know, next question might be, why would you want to do this? You know, this looks a little more complicated, right? Well, good news is these tools are actually sort of hidden behind the scenes. You don't really have to work with them directly. Uh, as we'll see later, all you have to do is a Maven build and uh, you're off to the races. You've got a WebAssembly. Uh, but there is extra complication, extra things that could go wrong potentially. So why would you want to do it? Well, first let's look at why you might not want to. Uh, you know, first of all, if, if you are well served already with the Java ecosystem and your, your team knows Java uh, or, or Scala or what have you, um, and you're used to the tools that are available in that ecosystem, you probably do want to stick with that. Uh, if, it's, if you're well served, if you're writing long-lived stateful applications and services, uh, the, that's what Java was made for. It's got decades of optimizations and fine-tuning for those sorts of things. Uh, if all your code is trusted, uh, you're writing a monolith or a microservice that, you know, all your dependencies are vetted, uh, you know, J Java does really well there. Uh, and then, uh, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the JVM has maximum throughput. It's the hotspot JVM uh, uh, from Sun and now Oracle uh, has been optimized for decades. Uh, it, it's an amazing piece of technology. Uh, and so I would sum this up as by default, if you're using Java, you should probably use the JVM, uh, especially if it fits the workloads that, um, that you have. And so when we would consider WebAssembly here uh, for Java, uh, it's kind of the flip side of that. Uh, many shops uh, these days want to be able to use 
uh, possibly a mix of languages that are JVM friendly and not so JVM friendly. Um, and the, you know, the hot thing these days is building services out of stateless functions, the whole serverless paradigm. Uh, and as we saw earlier, short-lived functions, you know, have applications in databases, uh, you know, smart contracts, et cetera. Uh, those cases are not necessarily what the JVM was designed to handle, uh, whereas WebAssembly, uh, that's kind of its bread and butter. Um, untrusted and or multi-tenant code, uh, this is definitely something you've seen in the browser, uh, serverless. Uh, if you're hosting a platform as a service or you're choosing a platform as a service, you want to know that there's strong security and isolation guarantees, that there's, your data is not going to be leaked uh, uh, you know, through side channel attacks or, or otherwise. Uh, so you know, a strong sandboxing model is super important. And then uh, even if you're not in a multi-tenant context, these days any modern app is going to have a long list of dependencies and transitive dependencies. Um, and you know, uh, for Java developers in particular, the whole log4j fiasco is fresh in mind. And people have been talking seriously about you know, how, do we, how do we deal with this? How do we address supply chain issues? And that's a multifaceted um, problem. Uh, but one of those facets is sandboxing and limiting the scope, uh, the capabilities, to use Luke's term, that uh, are available to a dependency. Uh, and you know, so if you're, uh, if you were a Java, you know, systems administrator uh, a few months ago, you were probably asking yourself, why did my logging framework make network calls uh, a, and why did it load classes off the internet to uh, to execute locally? Uh, you know, with WebAssembly, that's, you know, that's a non-starter. Uh, first of all, you wouldn't give your logging framework network capability unless it specifically needed it. And even then, you would restrict the set of uh, hosts it could access. And class loading just isn't really a thing uh, in WebAssembly. So all your code's going to be there up front. Uh, so, but one question often comes up, it certainly came up in my mind when I was working on this, is what about performance? Is sandboxing expensive? You know, what cost am I paying to achieve that sandboxing? Um, and so here's a chart. I just, uh, you know, performance is a complicated subject. Uh, it's hard to sum up in a single chart or a set of numbers. But what I've done here is I took just a handful of little uh, example CPU heavy types of uh, problems and benchmark them in various execution models. So just the, the main takeaway here is what I said before, maximum throughput is what you would get from OpenJDK or any other modern JVM. And that's what we see here in the blue. That's OpenJDK with no attempt at sandboxing. We're just trying to get the best possible performance. Uh, and then over in red, we have TVM plus WASM time, a popular WebAssembly runtime. And uh, we can see the, how performance stacks up there. Uh, and then in the yellow, we have OpenJDK again, but this time we're actually trying to sandbox it. We're actually forking a process for each invocation of our uh, function here. And, uh, and so we see that has a performance impact. Uh, and uh, just for fun, I threw in GraalVM's ahead of time native compile uh, uh, option which, uh, you know, and with, also with sandboxing, just to kind of see how WebAssembly with TVM stacks up against the other options you have for sandboxing Java. Um, if you've been around the Java ecosystem for a while, you know that there are, there were originally, I should say past tense, uh, ways to sandbox code within the JVM. Uh, that's been deprecated. The security manager, if you're familiar with that, that's been deprecated. There's no planned replacement. So these are really the only viable options you have for sandboxing Java. Uh, and and the, the, the main takeaway I want you to have here is that uh, TVM and WebAssembly are competitive with your other sandboxed options. You do lose a little bit in terms of single core raw throughput going from a non-sandbox scenario to a sandbox one. But for a lot of us, sandboxing is non-negotiable anyway, so we don't even need to look at that. And the other thing I want to mention here is that even though performance, there is a performance hit, you can gain some of that back because 
pure you know, sandbox functions where you're spinning them up very quickly and then tearing them down often don't need to garbage collect, and that's important in a managed language like Java uh, because the execution was so quickly, so, uh, executed so quickly that you can shut it down before you even need to garbage collect, and that's pretty much instantaneous. Plus, these things are embarrassingly, absurdly parallelizable. Uh, you know, when each invocation has its own memory, is not sharing state with others, you can horizontally scale these things uh, to the nth degree um, and win back some of that performance that you lost in terms of you know, pure CPU, single core. All right, so all this hopefully sounds pretty good. Uh, you know, we've got strict isolation, we've got competitive performance for, uh, compared to what else is out there. We're buzzword friendly, we're modern, we're hyper cool. Uh, so what's not to like about this? Well, there are some limitations. Uh, you know, they're all addressable, uh, but they're worth mentioning. Uh, right now, the uh, WebAssembly support in TVM itself is experimental. Uh, it was actually intended originally as a tool to transpile Java bytecode to JavaScript, and that's still its bread and butter uh, to be run uh, in the browser. Um, so there, there are some bugs hidden there. It works really well for the most part, but there's, you know, there, there's bugs, and we're going to need to address those. Uh, the standard library is incomplete. It's, uh, you know, th there was a deliberate decision, and I think it was the right one, not to reuse the OpenJDK class library uh, due to licensing concerns, the GPL, uh, and it's maybe not so business-friendly nature. Um, uh, reflection, if you're a jo longtime Java developer, you know that uh, reflection can be like this drug that uh, uh, you, know, uh, you, you tend to use to solve. It's the hammer you use to solve all the problems. Um, and many upstream um, dependencies might, might need it one way or the other. And that takes a little bit of extra upfront development effort. Uh, and then the WASI component model that uh, Luke talked about earlier, it is under rapid development. That's a good thing. You know, we're, we're making rapid progress. It also means the tools are churning, the interfaces, WIP bind gen, every day the interfaces change and whatnot. So it takes some work to, to keep up with. And then finally, debugging and profiling. If you're used to visual VM or you know, debugging in Eclipse, uh, the experience for WebAssembly is not nearly as slick. It is doable. Uh, it could be made better. Um, and let's see. So uh, in terms of next steps and ways we could improve, you know, it's basically a reflection of the last slide. Uh, we want to get more TVM tests passing. Uh, we want to add more features to the standard library as popular uh, third-party dependencies uh, need those extra features. Uh, we need to stay current with the component model as it evolves. We need to g ideally generate some debug info. Uh, there's various formats such as Dwarf, which WasmTime supports, uh, and it would be really cool to be able to just open up your favorite debugger and see all the local variables, see the line numbers and whatnot. Uh, so we, we want to get there. And uh, ideally, we uh, implement the JVMTI interface, which is the standard interface for Java uh, applications and debugging. Uh, and then finally, uh, the current generated bindings are not necessarily, they're, they're more a direct translation of the WebAssembly interface types. Uh, they could be made more idiomatic in terms of error handling via exceptions and so on. Right now, they're, they're very usable, but uh, could be better. So, uh, given all that, uh, let's see this in action. Let me see if I can find one moment, please. So, this is my pre recorded demo. We got volume here. Oh, it's going to snap back into place. That's silly. Oh, my goodness. Linux on the desktop. What do you know? Okay, let me...
I've written a so Java program got it. that uses WASI and the Spin SDK right. oh, yeah. to handle incoming HTTP requests and translate English words to Spanish words. It uses WASI to access the file system and load the dictionary of words. Uh, also, just to show off outbound HTTP capabilities, it can optionally proxy a response from another host. I'm not going to spend too much time looking at this code right now, but you're welcome to check out the link at the end of the presentation. Here we have the spin manifest that defines the environment that our application will run in, including the list of hosts we're allowed to make outbound HTTP requests to, as well as the set of files that will be available in our virtual file mount. In this case, that will include the dictionary from English to Spanish words. So let's go ahead and build the app. That just invokes the Maven command we specified in the manifest. And that looks good. So we'll spin up to run it. Bring that to the background. Let's find out what cloud is in Spanish, Nube. And since I'm already logged into my free Fermion cloud account using GitHub, I can go ahead and spin deploy, which will send it out to the internet. And then I can share this URL with other people. Go ahead and test it real quick. Find out what goodbye is in Spanish. Adios. And there you have it. Adios, amigos. Thank you. All right, so uh, that's about it. That was the demo. There's going to be a link here. There's all the links. So the benchmarks uh, I showed you, uh, the results I showed you, those are available in a repository here. There's a link to that. Um, uh, and as well to, as the demo I just did, the application, um, and a few other resources, the link to the Java binding generator in WhipBindGen, um, and then TVM WASI. I, I should just note, I didn't make this clear earlier, TVM WASI is a friendly fork of upstream TVM. Uh, we do have a PR open for upstream TVM. We'd like to get it upstream. It's not clear whether that really fits the mission of TVM as the lead maintainers see it. Uh, so it may not end up uh, upstream, in which case we'll just maintain a parallel friendly fork uh, going forward. Uh, so I think we have time for questions, if anybody has any questions. All self-explanatory. This is awesome. Thanks for presenting. Um, just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the transpilation between Java bytecode into WebAssembly and you know, what's compatible, what's not, how yeah. do you kind of polyfill any gaps? For sure. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, you know, uh, wanted to hear more about the transpilation that TVM does from Java bytecode to WebAssembly. Uh, the first thing to know is because WebAssembly currently doesn't have garbage collector support, doesn't have exception support, doesn't have any notion of reflection and whatnot, uh, that all gets bundled into the WebAssembly that you create, the component. Uh, and the cool thing is that amounts to about 180 kilobytes of, uh, you know, in the Hello World case. Uh, that's kind of where you're starting from. So very minimal. Um, otherwise, Java bytecode, if you, if you squint, it's, it's not that different from WebAssembly. And so things like working with, uh, you know, floats and integers and so on, that translates almost one-to-one. -one. You know, the, the stack model and the register model is a little bit different, but, you know, there, there's a straightforward transformation. Higher level instructions in Java bytecode, such as, um, uh, you know, invoke virtual, invoke interface, and whatnot. Those all have to be kind of built out of the WebAssembly primitives uh, to do lookups. So, uh, you know, there's static, there's a whole uh, static memory segment that is instantiated in the WebAssembly for virtual function tables and that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, but it, it, you know, it, it compiles down to pretty efficient code, and I'm sure, you know, if the 
proposals to add garbage collection and uh, exceptions to core WebAssembly gain traction, then we'll see that you know become an even uh, smoother and uh, you know more straightforward transition. Does that answer the question? Cool. Anything else? So in the course of your experiments, uh, I'm curious to see, one of the things we tend to see is this, the idea is really easy to see WebAssembly and fast firing functions model kind of thing. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of the things like Java.net, you know, like I'm from Microsoft, so it's a similar model and sure. approach, are, are based on sort of the idea of a kind of a heavy, scalable middle tier sort of concept. It's long running, it can do all kinds of cool things. Right. In the course of this experiment that you're, you're working on in this project, like, how did your thoughts evolve with respect to sort of where the strengths and weaknesses were a little bit more than what you just said here? Like, did you have things where like, oh, actually we could do that or, oh no, that's not really the thing we should do and so on. Yeah, well, so, you know, I was coming at it from the point of view of spin, you know, Matt talked, Matt and Radu talked a bit about, you know, the whole idea behind spin, and it was very much this mindset of serverless functions and whatnot. So, you know, I, I actually have about two decades of de de development experience in Java uh, and have worked on those big monolithic long-lived servers and whatnot. Uh, and I think there's still a place for that. There always is going to be a place for those. Uh, but I'm really excited about, you know, the component model and uh, in, in the serverless context uh, for uh, basically, you know, starting with stateless functions, using that as your super horizontally scalable building block, and then using, you know, a distributed data store or whatnot to kind of store your state, you know, between requests and so on to build those, those distributed systems. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's a matter of opinion and also a matter of use case whether microservices and nanoservices and serverless are appropriate versus a, a monolithic, you know, beefy server, big iron server. Um, and I think you just need to know your problem domain well enough to kind of make that decision. I don't think there's ever going to be the right, a single right answer. Uh, so that, that's why I was trying to be very balanced here. I think a lot of people just should stick with that, that Java model, that kind of just, uh, you know, long-lived stateful service model. And, uh, but I do think there's room for, you know, a, a different model depending on your use case. Uh, and, and again, you know, being able to reuse this in the context of databases, in the context of blockchain, in the context of the browser, uh, you know, I, I think we're just seeing a lot of different places people want to use Java or any other language, uh, and, and that's what this is all about. So. All right, that's, uh, that's all I got. Thanks for coming. All right.